Grazie. <clears throat> Thank you for coming back. If my voice disappears, it's because I've had to do too much shouting outside to make sure that people move in and out of the auditorium. It's a great pleasure to be back in Colombia again, uh, and I want us to now take a deliberately global view uh, of the world problem that we're talking about. I list these countries here. I'm currently living and working from an Australian base, but I have the honor and great pleasure of working with colleagues throughout my career in, in all of those countries and still in a number of them. And this is the message. If you agree with every one of those points, I can stop now. I'm going to flesh them out, however. It is quite clear that on a global, worldwide scale, we are not coping with oral diseases. <coughs> They're not managed successfully by the pleasant structure of the dental profession, otherwise things would be getting better, and they're not. <coughs> there are certainly too many of us as traditional old-fashioned dentists or dental specialists, and of course there's serious maldistribution around the globe and around the country. I mean, it is sheer madness that Colombia has grown from six to 36 dental programs in the last decade or so, and many of them should be closed. I think it's absolute madness that you continue in this direction. <clears throat> we, as dentists, mostly over-treat the affluent for considerable monetary gain. That's why many of us go into practice. So I believe the profession really needs to reinvent itself quite dramatically and to take the leadership in this reinvention. <clears throat> uh, if we don't, others will enforce it upon us. Many of us have argued we must be much better integrated with the whole of medicine and other the health scientists. So I think we should be oral physicians in the future and that we should work in teams using a wide variety of cadres to deliver oral health disease management and health maintenance as parts of teams with other cadres. And if we have time at the end, I might speculate on what those cadres might do. And of course, this is an immense global problem. Untreated decay of deciduous and permanent teeth. Don't let me ever hear any of you talk about the primary dentition when you mean the deciduous dentition. They are different things. We've got to get our biology straight. But untreated decay in deciduous and permanent teeth affects three billion people in the world uh, and is really in the top rank of chronic diseases affecting mankind. Severe periodontitis, however you define it, is a major problem, even if it's only 7 or 10 or so percent, that's what I would call severe, that is still a large number of people. <clears throat> and we've talked often, and you're all familiar now, with these common risk factor diagrams. So we've got to widen our thinking from plaque sitting on a tooth surface causing dental caries and causing gingivitis and subsequently periodontitis. Because we know very well, and we've known it for decades, but we don't think in this integrated fashion that these other diseases, obesity and diabetes, we talk about because this is sugar related and that's sugar related and they're both related to periodontal disease. Uh, but cancers uh, and these other uh, heart disease, of course, uh, is fundamentally affected by this wide range of risk factors which are common to those diseases. So why don't we have a common approach to disease prevention and health promotion instead of uh, talking all the time as narrow-minded dentists focused on the tooth, which, as I said earlier, is in a mouth, is in a patient, is in a family, and is in a community. Now, I said we want to take a global view. Uh, if you look at the globe, these countries are distorted in size on the basis of their population. So we know that India and China are the major population groups in the world today, and their economic power is dramatically rising. But for the future, 
population growth is going to be mostly in Africa. And this will provide uh, all kinds of new challenges for us. So if you look at population projections up to the year 2100, the Asian population is tapering off. And you know that Japan already has a tremendous problem with an aging population. So there aren't enough younger people to provide the money to provide the retirement funds for uh, Japanese elderly. The the rest of the world remains more or less the same. The bulge is in Africa. So we have tremendous challenges and tremendous opportunities in Africa if we take an African perspective. And we don't need to look at any individual countries here. The dark blue line today, the light blue line uh, projecting forward to 2050. But these people, to care for them, to prevent disease and to maintain health, is going to be a tremendous challenge for us, particularly because almost the whole of this continent is affected by famine in both the Su South Sudan uh, and Nigeria at the moment. You have Nigeria as the richest country in Africa facing serious famine uh, and conflict and internally and externally displaced people add tremendously to the challenges of promoting and maintaining health. <clears throat> so. What are we talking about uh, when we say oral health? <clears throat> well, uh, uh, some people are perhaps a bit skeptical of the new FDI definition, uh, and it's not new really. Many of us, including the FDI, have been saying this for many years. But what it does usefully point out that we're not just talking about freedom from pain. We're not just talking about the ability to chew. Uh, we're talking about a wide range of social and emotional interactions which are fundamental to a healthy mouth. And some of their uh, subsidiary statements uh, that this is a fundamental component of overall health and well-being, uh, the social emphasis, which many of you from the floor have sought us to emphasize today, uh, and the fact that it's influenced by the patients and the community's perception of what is health and what is quality of life is very important. So we're taking and holistic and wide view of oral health. And perhaps to labor the point, these what we call upstream determinants, uh, and they've been referred to by several of my colleagues earlier, are just as important as the proximal factors uh, of what's happening down this end. So we talk a lot about diet and hygiene and smoking and alcohol, but all of these factors are very, very much more upstream they have a measurable influence, uh, and they're all societal issues. If I just take as a fleeting example, um, obesity. These happen to be UK data which show the proportion of obese people in uh, year six and uh, earlier on in classes at school, how this is absolutely a straight line by the index of multiple deprivation. So in the United Kingdom, obesity is a product of low socioeconomic group. In less developed parts of the world, the, the reverse might be true, and we've just published a paper saying this on a population in India uh, because parents who've got the money to feed their children uh, high calorific uh, diets tend to be more obese than the poorer people in India, uh, but they don't necessarily get caries because those middle class parents are more aware and practice better oral hygiene in their families. We also know of the enormous oral systemic interactions and uh, enormous amount of interest in uh, periodontal infections, perhaps um, encouraging precipitating worsening uh, cardiovascular health. But I'm not going to go through this. It's in every textbook that you would like to pick up. But remember, the mouth is in the body. Infections in the mouth have consequences all over the body in almost every organ system. Uh, this is a slight sidetrack to make a fleeting 
criticism of industry. Uh, isn't that a great advertisement uh, saying that Coca-Cola is there to help families get fit? And these things below, which you might have difficulty in reading, it doesn't matter, are the grants that the Coca-Cola family has made to dental research projects across the United States. And both those statements are unethical in my view. Uh, we should not be accepting money from a company like Coca-Cola to perform research, uh, nor should they be allowed to advertise their product as a healthy one. So let's look over the major diseases now uh, at the evidence that things are not getting better. <clears throat> and several people have referred to the data from the Global Burden of Diseases study. So these are data on untreated caries across the globe, which have not decreased for decades. Uh, here we look at a curve from 1990 and a curve from 2010 at both the prevalence and the incidence of untreated caries. And you can't separate those curves, the boundaries of the 95% confidence intervals. In other words, the shape of those curves has not changed at all between 1990 and 2010, which tells us that however well Scandinavia has done, the global average is not better. That's what I meant by my first bullet point. We have not made any progress globally on managing dental caries. And I'm going to make a few observations about the caries process. <laughs> Uh, I've always said it's not one disease, but it's a multiplicity of diseases or a family of diseases uh, with different clinical outcomes. So this kind of childhood dental caries you're familiar with probably shares uh, most of the same common risk factors as lifelong caries. Uh, and it can result, as you're all aware and the pedodontists are aware, with great breakdown uh, pulp polyps and so forth. <clears throat> That, as a form of dental caries, has a different mixture of etiological or risk factors. This is an adult who's had radiotherapy for a head and neck neoplasm, has salivary gland atrophy, poor saliva function, and we're getting caries now on the incisal surfaces of teeth, which would not normally be at risk. So, what is the etiology? Well, yes, it's mostly related to a biofilm on the tooth surface, but it's modulated by all those things that I've been referring to already. And in this presentation, there are a number of quite old slides, quite deliberately, because I believe there are some basic truths here which we've failed to deal with. So, <clears throat> this is a statement that was written by this gentleman in a report that was commissioned by the British Society for Dental Research way back in the 1980s. He was a very distinguished microbiologist. He was director of the Public Health Laboratory Service in the United Kingdom. And he wrote what we were calling dental plaque seems to have been held to be inherently bad, the cause of much oral disease, justifying vigorous attempts at his total removal. And what he puts in parenthesis there is the really telling bit. A curious attitude to something that is clearly as natural a part of the tooth as is the bacterial flora a part of the colon. So aren't you glad that when you go to see your general medical practitioner, he or she doesn't seem to think it's necessary to take a sharp instrument and scrape your colon before he lets you go. This is a ridiculous oversimplification of the way we've thought about oral and dental diseases. I know you can't read that, but that is something I had fun drawing in 1970 about the processes which influence dental caries progression. So the center of it is very simple. Carb fermentable carbohydrate in contact with microorganisms produce acid, it, demoraliz it demoralizes, yes, <laughs> uh, it demineralizes enamel and dentine, you subsequently get 
proteolysis of the organic matrix of dentine as well. But this process is affected by this wide range of etiological factors, both local and wider, and by a wide range of um, uh, preventative, no, sorry, by a wide range of predisposing and resisting factors. And any discussion of dental caries in a community involves looking at all of those factors. In one sense, it is an extremely simple disease. This is the simplicity of it. In another sense, it is quite complex, and we have to take that very holistic view. So well, I don't need to labor this. The simple chemistry of generation of plaque from fermentable carbohydrate, except to emphasize, as I hope we all teach vigorously, that remineralization is happening all the time, as demineralization is happening in waves. And Dr. Manji will show you some interesting aspects of that flux between demineralization and remineralization tomorrow morning. It is a balance. But sugar is the main local culprit in that background of all those other predisposing and resisting factors. And these are data from the United Kingdom, but it doesn't matter where they come from. Uh, the hidden sugars in uh, processed foods it remains a major, major problem in all of our societies. And although, thankfully, this large chunk, which is attributable, as I say, these are UK data, uh, to it's what you would call soda or acidified uh, carbonated drinks, is a major component here, which is justifying the action in many countries to either tax or otherwise deal at a societal level with the excess consumption assumption. Uh, so in this sense, we're pushing against an open door. You probably know more about some of these studies in some of these countries than I do. Uh, I have read superficially the publications on the Mexican taxing of um, sugar drinks, uh, which are, I think, open to a little bit more critical interpretation. But taken at face value, it seems to be effective. It is a community move which appeals to me in a mixture of top-down and bottom-up approaches to prevention uh, because government legislation is one of the, is the most important of the things that have resulted in reductions of tobacco consumption around the world and in improvements in health for all of the diseases associated with tobacco smoking, cancer, uh, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and oral and other head and neck cancers. The Framework Convention on Tobacco control has been, I think, an enormous success, and I would like to think we could go in the same direction with a framework convention on sugar and a framework convention on arica nut, which is the other main cause of oral cancer worldwide. Still thinking about the complex factors influencing dental caries, let me take, as a non-microbiologist, a more naive approach to the oral microbiome than Gunnar did a few moments ago. With modern next generation sequencing, we now know that there are something like a thousand species of microorganisms in the human mouth. We have only ever cultivated about 50% of them. That means we know practically nothing about their metabolism, about what virulence factors or toxins they might produce. So with all the emphasis the world puts on lactobacilli and streptococcus mutans, uh, maybe the answers in this other 50% that we really don't know anything about. And the human oral microbiome uh, consortium around the world is producing masses of evidence at the moment which we're only beginning to relate back to disease. Most of the descriptions are of what's there, and of course presence doesn't indicate pathogenicity. But this is producing a just staggering amount of information, which requires enormous computer power to take forward, and that's a, a, a graph of the speciation that is possible now with very small volumes of starting micro 
microbial mass uh, and the information that can come out of it. So it's an exciting time. It's very high tech, uh, but that shouldn't stop us from dealing with the basics that we already understand about the caries process. Now, uh, Professor Darlin uh, spoke to you about the way the world had waved between a non-specific Clark hypothesis, a specific Clark hypothesis, and perhaps now some keystone microorganisms being there. I think most of us, certainly I, am comfortable, and these slides are from Phil Marsh, that what we are doing here, or observing here, with both caries and periodontal diseases, is a, an ecological shift and an ecological disaster. So these are two examples of ecological disasters in society. The extinction of the dinosaurs with a meteorite hit the earth is another example of an ecological disaster. And so are most of the common forms of caries and of periodontal disease. They are simply ecological disasters rather than specific infections. I think that applies importantly both to the caries process and to most of the common forms of minor or moderate periodontal disease. Sticking with the caries discussion for a moment, that's a simple slice through a tooth photographed against a black piece of paper. And you see here some fissure lesions, there's cavitation here, uh, and Two things I want us to notice are reactive dentine at the pulp, which has been produced in response to the increased permeability of enamel and dentine, and most importantly, the production of sclerotic dentine, which walls off the lesion. That is a fundamental defense reaction, which we have to encourage in the tooth in managing the process of dental caries. And should we, as we probably might with an overt cavity like this, seek to restore that, you must never remove any dentine below that. Because dentine which is infected for a long period of this process is only above that sclerotic zone. Uh, and I don't want to get into the technicalities of restorative dentistry, but I have always taught the only way to excavate putatively infected dentine, which is also demineralized, is with a hand instrument. So so you can actually feel the difference. And uh, to jump in there with an air rotor and remove a great chunk uh, of healthy tooth substance is, in my mind, quite frankly, criminal. Let us also remember that it still happens that infection spreads. This child has bilateral edema and is at great risk of a cavernous sinus thrombophlebitis, phlebothrombosis. Uh, this gentleman has a submasseteric abscess. You stick the knife in there, you get lots of pus. He might be at risk of Ludwig's angina. People did, and people still do, die from dental caries. So arresting the process early remains fundamental to us. So let me make, in summary, a, a few key observations on the process of dental caries. And I'm clearly going to run out of time, so I'll speed up and skip a few things. But I've already made the point that on a global scale, we're not winning the war. Uh, oral biofilms are normal and natural, and the health-associated microflora must be retained. Broad-spectrum antiseptics are to be discouraged because they damage the health-associated microflora as well as any putative pathogens which might be present. Hence, antiseptic mouthwashes are a no-no. Antiseptic mouthwashes should not be advocated for regular or daily use in patients, but have a place if you have a wound or, or a wound healing preoperatively or a wound healing situation. Yet, we let the manufacturers of these substances uh, advertise them freely on television and give them as gifts to dental schools and they sit on the benches all around the dental schools and the students are using them irrationally without a thought for where they fit in the disease process. Uh, let us keep industry out of our dental schools. Uh, the upstream and downstream risk factors have to be managed, of course. Uh, and this is, as I've tried to point out, a multifactorial disease process. And there are genetic and epigenetic 
predispositions which affect host defense factors, whether they derive from saliva, bloodstream, gingival curricular fluid, or within the tooth substance. Okay, it's excessive and frequent intakes of fermentable carbohydrate which dominate this as the major environmental risk factors, but the other things are important. I suggest top-down approaches to regulation of sugars could be effective, uh, and remember that enamel has great power to remineralize, that saliva is the best remineralizing fluid in the world. It has several advantages. At the pH of secretion, it is supersaturated with phosphate ions. It is at the right temperature, and would you believe it's free? You don't have to pay a company for, to a, a nicely packaged remineralizing solution. Uh, and remember that dentine itself also has great power to defend itself, and we must harness those defense reactions in teeth. <clears throat> so many of these arguments are true also of what I call destructive periodontitis, this 7 or 10 percent of the population that have a genuine disease. And the prevalence and incidence around the world uh, in this other paper, which is focused on periodontal diseases, has not changed over these decades. So we're not winning the war against periodontal disease either. Fortunately, the global burden of disease data do show that there's been some improvement in extensive tooth loss in many populations around the world. So we are, as a profession, achieving something. Because what is the major cause of tooth loss around the world? The answer is, of course, dentists. And if you go to those populations with limited access to dental care, most of the people, as has been pointed out already, most of the people keep most of their teeth for most of their lives. Periodontal diseases, of course, also vary in predisposing factors uh, which strongly influence disease outcome. Uh, that's an uncommon form of periodontal disease. Does anybody want to offer a diagnosis? That's a child with leukemia. Uh, anybody want to offer a diagnosis on that? That's a bit of periodontal disease, I would say. Uh, and that's a patient with Kaposi sarcoma, who is, of course, HIV positive. So do remember the extremes and that systemic diseases predispose to that. And really one of the most critical papers, which has taught us that it's not just about plaque volume, it's not just about cleaning your teeth, let alone <coughs> swishing your teeth with Listerine um, twice a day <coughs> is this paper from South Africa by Reddy uh, and, in, and uh, Feroz, forgive me, Feroz referred to this um, in spite of large amounts of plaque uh, there was little evidence of periodontal destruction in that population and also uh, the studies from China uh, which I'll show, refer to briefly in a moment. So if I were to make a short list of risk factors for periodontal diseases, a wide range of systemic diseases, and I say deliberately from severe disease to the common cold, because when you have a common cold, there is a distinctive cell-mediated immune depression which allows inflammation to expand and become more serious. Tobacco, we know lots about, both smoked and smokeless. Well, what specificity are there amongst the pathogens? We've heard a lot of discussion today. We know about diabetes. There is certainly a genetic predisposition. Uh, how else do you partly explain this 7 or 10 percent? There's been a lot of literature on a uh, T1, T2, Thi1, Thi2 imbalance in the lymphocyte uh, population and imbalances in genetic polymorphisms uh, for the production of various cytokines. Uh, remember that your ability of your host to be effective uh, is determined in utero. It's determined genetically by what you inherit for your parents and that the uh, intrauterine, uh, prenatal, perinatal and infant events really affect your susceptibility to disease in later life. At the moment, we have some very interesting data along these lines. General nutrition affects your ability uh, to respond. Alcohol, stress, if your bones are weak, 
your periodontal inflammation may be more destructive. And we know a wide range of drugs which will both uh, minimize and increase your susceptibility to periodontal disease. So it's not just about keeping a tooth clean. Uh, and I meant to refer, it's a little bit out of order, to the data from Ola's group on the Chinese followed longitudinally uh, and the mean attachment loss over time did not significantly vary between age groups and is remarkably similar to populations who do have access to oral care. So whether or not you have a workforce which is on the traditional lines with lots of dentists in the neighborhood doesn't make much difference to those people's progression of periodontal disease. So if I were to list quickly the risk factors uh, uh, and, and their impact on the educational process, which is really what we're trying to focus on today. There's variable strength of evidence for the above mentioned risk factors. Uh, and there's variable strength of evidence which about individual patients, which vary over time. I like to think that each patient is unique and requires an individualized management strategy. And that has to be based on thorough history, examination, diagnosis, and frequently special tests. If you take, for instance, the extreme example of the leukemic child. So we need whole patient and whole lifestyle strategies. The only thing in my book that works as a predictor of risk is severe disease for age. And that applies to both the caries process and the periodontal diseases process. And the corollaries of that for education is that we must educate those who care for these patients must more effectively in medicine. We need to be oral physicians if we're going to remain as a profession and some of us are trying to demolish us uh, as a large profession. So all of these understandings of the complexities but at the same time the core simplicity of these disease processes have strong educational implications. <clears throat> to say a few minutes now, time's marching, about oral cancer. <clears throat> we really knew <laughs> do need to make this situation history. I still see this time and time again, massive tumors in many of the countries in which I work, and we are not dealing with this. So in summary, cancers of the head and neck vary between the top cancer in the world, Sri Lanka and parts of India, to about the sixth or tenth most common globally. And the world doesn't take them very seriously. Mortality rates remain unacceptably high, and it's a global health burden. And this, rise, this burden is rising. There are marked subside differences, uh, and we have to regard ourselves again as dealing with a family of different diseases, knowledge of which demands different approaches to prevention, diagnosis of treatment. Heavy burden unfortunately falls on low and middle income countries, but there are large differences by socioeconomic status in every country in the world. And again, the major risk factors are well understood, uh, so why are we so unsuccessful in managing them? <coughs> the global trends are, are clear. <clears throat> In absolute numbers, this is what we're dealing with. At an average around the world, this is the sixth most common cancer. There are that many new cases. Most of them are in the oral cavity. The oropharynx, which we know is now rising due to human papillomavirus infections, uh, and cancer of the larynx are about the same numbers. It's being overtaken by oropharynx. Nasopharynx, which is an Epstein-Barr virus-driven disease, is falling in many countries. But the annual death rate is extraordinarily high from just this range of limited, this limited anatomical range of cancers. And this problem is not getting better. We don't need to look at this in detail, but there is a large range across the world of incidence and mortality rates in different regions. So this kind of geographical epidemiology allows us geographical pathology to look at major risk factors. And the incidence and mortality rates are actually rising in many countries. So 
it's interesting if you look from the 1950s up until about now in this graph which we generated recently from uh, the international databases, uh, we knew that the French were having a particular difficulty uh, over recent decades and they really got their act together several decades ago by tobacco control, to some extent alcohol and other factors. The Hungarians and others in Central and Eastern Europe had rocketing stages, particularly uh, um, before they joined the common market, uh, and uh, got their act together now in many of these countries. But there are rising trends in many of these other countries and major problems in Russia. There are major problems in the United Kingdom in rising trends from a relatively low base. And these are some data of ours from India, which uh, look at mouth uh, and tongue cancer separately, mouth and tongue, in males and in females, and we're projecting forward the growth in the number of cases to 2020 and 2030, and there's this rapid rise particularly in mouth cancer, which includes, uh, and the tongue here, <coughs> um, you add them together, this is a dramatic rise in the burden that India and the rest of South Asia and Southeast Asia are going to have to cope with. It's our job to arrest this. We know what the major risk factors are. And there is a clear dose-response relationship for tobacco smoking, for tobacco and arica nut chewing, and for alcohol consumption. And these effects, when they interact, are not just additive, they're not just multiplicative, they are super multiplicative. So why, why is that still a major problem? Let me share with you two laws. The first of these is Johnson's law which has it that every malignant neoplasm is a unique biological entity in a unique host, even though we know a lot about common risk factors. My surgical colleague John Langdon also has a law. Cancer is a systemic disease. You do not cure a systemic disease by chopping off part of the body. Excision of head and neck cancers is technically very difficult and very mutilating. So chronic diseases require lifelong management uh, and there is probably uh, no such thing as a genuine cure because the risk factors remain, the preconditioning of the tissue remains, your susceptibility to second and third neoplasms uh, is, remains. Uh, treatment should be tailored to the individual and we are now genuinely in the age of individualized therapy. So we're not there yet, but we are increasingly able to do a mutational screen of every individual patient's tumor uh, and say this tumor is likely to respond to this particular drug. And almost every day I open my email, there is a message from the FDA or the National Cancer Network in the US and comparable uh, bodies in Australia and in the UK telling me that yet another drug has been licensed for yet another uh, cancer. I can tell you though at this stage that the clinical trials of all of these are very immature and at best these drugs, particularly the modern immunotherapies, uh, are giving patients uh, just a few weeks extra life. Uh, now I won't read you through all of those uh, because of the time, but we actually do understand most of those risk factors. We understand how to prevent uh, and we uh, understand how on a population level to minimize the risk. We've known that for a long time and getting these declarations such as the one uh, we're hoping to write coming out of this meeting accepted by society because it's just dentistry and because it's in the mouth is a real difficulty. I'll skip through HIV disease which remains a major problem except to make this fi final point with this slide on HIV. It might be hard to read. This is a ladder of failing immune response 
failing or dropping, dropping CD4 counts. So the patients uh, are increasingly immunosuppressed. And this is the list of opportunistic infections which arise with increasing immunosuppression. And these data come from the Indian cohort, the South Indian cohort with which I've been working for about 15 or 20 years now. And many of these things which click in early are in the head and neck and in the mouth. Herpes simplex, uh, oral hairy leukoplakia, candidiasis in the mouth and in the oropharynx. So we have as dentists a fundamental opportunity for early diagnosis to allow early intervention. And <coughs> HIV management remains an important duty uh, of every dentist. So <coughs> what do I think we can do about these dreadful failures of ours? as dental professionals. I've already hammered this. For goodness sake, stop new dental schools and, and severely rethink whether you can close many. Restrict the number of dentists and specialists in training. I'm horrified to see my university and yours advertising more and more training opportunities for specialists. It's the wrong way to go. We have to put more effort into primary prevention at a community level. We have to work with the rest of health and social sciences. It's been very well explained by Lois and others. We have to educate the public, but we have to legislate against all these major uh, etiological and risk factors. Uh, in delivering care in a more effective manner, we probably need more demonstration programs with customized teams. That's an important part uh, of my vision. Of course, we have to continue to understand the situation in epidemiological terms in order to monitor whether or not we're being successful. To do that, I believe, to create these teams, we have to change the cadres in nature within the workforce. Uh, and these have to be flexible uh, with integrated curricula with, I'd like to see, professional transitions. Now, I have a vision of, of exactly the way I would like to go about it. Um, that's a further bit of background. Uh, how do we get this government action uh, and this delivery by healthcare teams? Uh, well, direct taxation is the most effective thing to uh, suppress tobacco use in society. It has to be brought about by some kind of community-wide insurance. Uh, maybe Obamacare is going down the drain and the Australian models are not perfect, but a lot of that means that the people uh, with lower incomes are able to get some insurance and you can pay a lot for your fancy restorative dentistry if you want to. But we need to be working with all sectors of society to get programs going of both prevention, screening and initial intervention in workplaces uh, and other institutions of that kind. There are many barriers to this. There will be the most important barrier is going to be the organized professions. Most private practitioners, most right of center politicians, uh, existing profitable health insurance businesses uh, because they're there to make money for their shareholders and I dare say large sectors of the public will be resistance or it will take a long time for us to drag them with us. I guess in short this is a national health service and it's a very utopian and socialist model uh, but I think we have a lot more work to do in enunciating this, but I feel that's the only direction in which we can go. So I'm both negative and positive. I'd like to see efforts to move in this direction with demonstration programs and the advocacy that we've spoken about, and I'd like at the same time to see a deliberate restriction on the overproduction of our sort of dentist uh, which we currently have. This is a little bit too complex. The uh, other thing I was going to show you about educational levels and the way I see uh, universities leading it but further education colleges and so on playing a role in the less demanding or less skilled professions and the teams have to be made up appropriately. Not of dental this, dental that, dental the other thing about health promoting teams across the whole spectrum 
of human health. Uh, and I made that slide, which Lois showed you too, because I was quite impressed by Scott Thomas and Lois's thinking about the attributes of an ideal healthcare system. You saw the front page of the reprint of her paper, but this is the guts. These are the actual sensible things that that paper lists. So, time's gone, but plus ça change, ladies and gentlemen. We wrote this way back in the 1990s. In the past several decades, attitudes to both prevention and management of dental diseases have been dominated by plaque control procedures regarding all plaque as potentially pathogenic. This is irrational, and it still is. Dental plaque represents just one of the resident microbial floras to be found on all external and internal body surfaces. It's only dangerous if there is an inadequate local or systemic host defense, or if an ecological shift of the kind that both Gunnar and I have talked about has taken place, resulting in the production of virulence factors. So we, between us, this little group of six, represent over 250 years of experience in this area, uh, and we haven't changed our minds uh, on some of these issues. Uh, at least I haven't. And finally, we are actually pushing against an open door. Uh, the society at large and many uh, other health professions are asking this same question. What have we got wrong? Surely we must be engaging upstream. Surely we must be taking the public with us. And I don't know whether you're aware of this issue of Scientific American, uh, which uh, the full issue on the future of oral health just a few months ago. It talks about the dental medical divide. Uh, it does say we've advanced tremendously in diagnostics and therapeutics, but it talks about patient empowerment and it emphasizes prevention. And that's going out to the public. The public are thinking this way. Many professionals are thinking this way. I would say to you, it's not uh, a barrier that's un jumping overable, if I might make up a terrible word, the door is ajar. The time is now, and I think there is absolutely no excuse for inaction. That's what I mean by being dramatic or possibly having an explosion. Thank you.